This morning we were looking at the subject of being filled with the Holy Spirit and uh, all that that entails. And we started by having a historical look at Pentecostalism, or the founding of Pentecostalism. This was important because many of the areas today which affect the body of Christ come originally, or originally really took root in the Christian church around about the turn of the century. And so it was important for us to actually look at the, what anybody who is expert or anybody who is certainly learned would say was the founder, who was the founder of Pentecostalism, and that was Charles Parham. So we looked at a little bit of his theology, and we looked at how a major doctrine of that era began effectively with Charles Parham. He certainly wasn't the first to teach it, he wasn't the first one to believe it. But he was kind of, in, in one sense, he was the one who really laid the seed of the group. Others before him had planted the seed, but they didn't grow, certainly to the extent that we have today. But Charles Parham, he really did, unfortunately, lay the seed that grew today. We also clearly established that uh, many, many Pentecostal people stand apart from a lot of the nonsense that's going on today. And we established very clearly that there are, of course, differences in each Pentecostal church that we may go to. That is certainly the case. And also that many, if not most of the things that Charles Parham either believed or espoused would not be believed by Pentecostals today as well. But it was necessary to look at what he believed and what he taught because it forms the foundation of many of the errors today. The idea that, number one, God brought new gifts or suddenly outpoured new gifts of the Spirit because the return of Christ was imminent. And that is actually the foundation of the theology of most of the signs and wonders workers today, whether it be uh, Roddy Dab Brown or any of the well-known names that we're all unfortunately familiar with, as we say, all the usual suspects. Because they believe the same thing. They believe that because the return of Christ is imminent, and I'm not saying it isn't, or, or, or I'm not saying that his return isn't imminent, because his return is imminent, we should expect to see an increase in signs and wonders. We should expect to see an increase in revival phenomena. And so it was important, first of all, to lay that foundation to show where these people were coming from, what it was they believed and why it was wrong. In a, in a sense, to tear down some of the errors that are still, unfortunately, long-standing and are very well established. So tonight, I'm going to recap a few of those points. Then we shall have a look at building up, if you like. We've told down now we need to rebuild in its place. And we're looking at the subject of being baptized with the Spirit versus being filled with the Spirit. This is a particular area of teaching that is very, very confused amongst Pentecostals and indeed subsequently amongst Charismatics. And it seems as the Charismatic movement is encroaching into every denomination, regardless of what badge or, or flavor they claim to be, it is very important for us to look at this. We said that, and I said this morning again very clearly, and I have to reiterate these points because people always come back to me and say I said something I didn't say. I also stress the fact that people were right, at least in their zeal, that we need to be filled with the Spirit. People are also right in their belief that this filling of the Spirit is not a once for all experience. It is a continual experience in which we are commanded to walk. We are commanded to be filled with the Spirit continually. It is a present, but continuous experience. Now again, Pentecostal people differ on uh, the finer points of this. Some of them will claim, uh, or some of the certainly earliest, the earlier holiness Pentecostals would have claimed that there was a once for all experience whereby someone was sanctified once and for all, if you like, sorry to repeat the expression, but they were sanctified once and for all. Sinless perfectionism. And the terms like set and blessing and so on became uh, the norm. But again, you will have some Pentecostal people who will stress, well, it's not a second blessing in me, but a continual blessing. One baptism, but many things. And yes, they are right in their statement. 
But again, at other points, they then seem to teach something completely different, parallel to what they just taught, by confusing baptism with the Spirit with filling with the Spirit. And I'm going to show you very clearly tonight that the two are actually not the same, they're not synonymous, they are different. And it's important for us to recognise that difference, because <coughs> if we uh, get our terminology wrong, as soon as we begin building on that, unfortunately the edifice will be very, very wonky by the time we finish. So then, just to look at a couple of the points that uh, we covered this morning, and the same as of the theology, we looked at the need for walking in the Spirit today, and certainly the greatest need of the, of the church today, or some of the greatest needs of the church today, are, include ecumenism or ecumenism. <coughs> we need power for preaching. We need purging of our consciences. We need the opening of our ears to God's spirit, and we need the converting of our selfish hearts to God's needs. All of those, and many more, can be added, are things that only come about as a result of walking in the Spirit or being filled with the Spirit, the two being the same thing. The answer to ecumenism, Spirit-filled believers. Because a person who is walking in the Spirit will be open to the Holy Spirit, will be taught of the Holy Spirit, will be controlled by the Holy Spirit. And when people come and present false doctrine, it will be seen for what it is. <laughs> But being filled with the Spirit, of course, is, or sometimes can be, experiential, unlike baptism with the Spirit, which we're looking at in the moment. And it doesn't just suddenly come upon us, in a sense. There is uh, some discipline on our part. So let's begin. We have a lot of scriptures to look at tonight, so it will be useful if you have a pen and paper for you to go home and check these. Let's begin by looking at what baptism with the Spirit is, as defined by Scripture. I've already started by saying that being baptised with the Holy Spirit is not being filled with the Spirit. And I'm going to show you that absolutely, uh, conclusively from Scripture. And if being baptised with the Spirit is not being filled with the Spirit, it's wrong to confuse the two or to use both of those expressions interchangeably as though they are the same thing. And I'll show you why when we get towards the end of the sermon. Well, we begin in John 1.33. Baptizing with water, but one mightier than I come, 
A latchet of loose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Please note the next verse. Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff will be burned with fire unquenchable. The, the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. Now it's important to read both of those two verses together to get the context. At the turn of the century there was the Holy Ghost baptism. Then there was the fire baptism. And then there were some who had the baptism with dynamite and the baptism with bloodite and a whole lot of other ites that you can be baptized with. What John is saying, or what he's basically talking about, is salvation versus damnation. This Jesus, this Messiah who is coming, he's going to do two things. First, he will baptize with the Holy Spirit, salvation. Secondly, he will baptize with fire, damnation. First, he will gather the wheat, that's believers, into the barn. Second, he will gather the chaff, that's unbelievers, into the fire. That is the context of those verses. As uh, one of your famous evangelists used to preach, it is either bow or burn. And that is the message here. So again, notice he says he will baptize with the Holy Spirit, not in. The reason he says with, with, is because in the context of the Trinity, Jesus does, Jesus baptizes with the Holy Spirit, or it, is the, or it is the Holy Spirit himself who does the act of baptizing. Okay? Now again, we go forward, we go to John chapter 15, verse 26. So we begin to read when this will take place. Now, John 15, of course, all knows that all knows the chapter where Jesus talks about being divine. We have this great teaching of Jesus where this wonderful truths are presented, where Israel no longer is the vineyard, people are still to, uh, to find God, but now Jesus claiming himself to be divine. And you must now join me, he said, if you are to be saved. And he talks about a time, of course, of persecution, and so on. And in verse 26 he says this, But when the Comforter has come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of Truth, which proceeded from the Father, he shall testify of me. Jesus says that he will send the Comforter. In other places we read that Jesus will send another Comforter after he leaves, the Holy Spirit. But please notice in verse 26, Jesus says, I will send him. I will send him. Not, I will bring him. Not, I will give him to you in the context of being present with us physically. But I will send him. In other words, the Holy Spirit will come, this promise, this Spirit, Holy Spirit from the Father, will come after Jesus has ascended. Now, if that's the case, we should be able to find that in Scripture, shouldn't we? So we turn to Luke 24. And here we see Jesus <coughs> exhorting his disciples to remain in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father. Now, please note all these points because the timing in which these things take place is very important to our discussion. Luke 24, verses 46 to 49. And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer and to be risen and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. Please note again, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in Jerusalem until ye be endured with power from on high. Please notice again, Jesus says he will send the Holy Spirit. Secondly, he said they must wait at Jerusalem for this. We turn to the second scripture, Acts 1, verses 9 to 11. (coughs) 
In fact, we might as well begin at verse 7. Acts 1, verse 7 to 11. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Please notice that just literally before Jesus' ascension, he tells them that they are about to receive this power. He is about to send the Holy Spirit. Now this is just before he goes to heaven. Okay? Now from that you can conclude that whatever this work of the Holy Spirit is, it hasn't yet been given. It hasn't yet been given, it hasn't yet been received. Did you follow so far? But then, of course, people will raise objections and say, well, what about John 20? Didn't Jesus say, receive the Holy Spirit in John 20, verse 22? Jesus, of course, speaking to his disciples, breathed on them and said, receive ye the Holy Ghost, didn't he? But please notice that in this place, Jesus actually talks about the fact that this promise was still yet to come. And this was just prior to his ascension. Secondly, Jesus actually tells them that the endurance from high which will be sent from the Father must be sent, not given, not breathed upon. There's a difference. What happens in John 20 is a filling of the Holy Spirit. Or if you like, an endurance of power of the Holy Spirit. Very much the same as what the apostles experienced or the disciples experienced during the earthly ministry of Jesus. They were given authority to cast out demons. They were given authority to heal the sick. But this is not that which was the promise of the Father. And we go on and we'll see that that is the case. Now remember at the beginning I said to you that nowhere in the scripture can we read the expression baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's the second point for you to write down. Number two, not one place in the scripture are we told that Jesus is baptized with the Holy Spirit. But we are told that he's anointed by. We are told he is filled with. Okay, make a mental note of that and I'm going to pick up again on that. So in John 20, verse 22, the truth is simply they were filled with, but not baptized with. That was still going to happen not many days hence after John 20, which is what we know as the story from Acts 2. Again, if we turn to Acts 11 and verse 15, we read Peter's defense, if you like, or report to the church in Jerusalem. And he's reporting to them the events which took place at Cornelius' household. Cornelius is one of, or he is the last one of three very important groups of people. He is a Gentile. Before him were Samaritans who were half Jews. And before the half Jews, the Samaritans were the Jews at Pentecost. This was the way that God had decreed, or the order in which God had decreed that people were to be saved. Please remember that the book of Acts is not an epistle, the book of Acts is a narrative. It's a historical account. You cannot build a doctrine from the book of Acts. You must read the book of Acts in light of what the epistles tell us. But here's what he says, and please note the time here is important. The Saving of Cornelius' household is, according to most Bible scholars, something like ten years after the day of Pentecost. That means that no Gentiles were saved in the first eight or ten years 
of the ministry. They find, a lot of people find that very strange. But that's what the Bible tells us. Because Acts is what we call, or the events in Acts are age inaugurating processes which took place once and for all in, in many cases. God had chosen this is how he was going to do it. Now after calling this his household, people just repent and believe the faith in Christ and they're saved. But in the book of Acts, first of all, God does it as he wills, when he wills. So let's hear Peter's account. Verse 15. And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Now he's quoting John here, isn't he, from Luke uh, chapter 3 that we already read. He's quoting Luke in this account of Cornelius' household being saved. And interestingly, when we go back to Acts 2, and we hear Peter's defense there, he even says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, doesn't he? This is that. This is the promise of the Father. Now please note again a very important point in Acts 11 and 15. Peter did not say, uh, because there was evidence that, that they received the Holy Spirit, because not only were they baptized with the Spirit, but they were also at the same time filled with the Spirit, and they had the evidence of speaking in other languages. But notice what Peter says. He didn't say, well we knew they did, because we saw the same evidence as we experienced uh, last night at the prayer meeting, when we were all praying in tongues. They didn't say that. No, he said, as of us at the beginning. That's Pentecost. That's ten years before. That's not last Sunday, that's not last week. Notice that he uses the royal we, as of us, or who is the us, in this passage. It tells us in verse 1, and the apostles and brethren that were in Judea and the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they were that were of the circumcision contended with him. So all the people who are there listening to this are included, that includes the apostles. <coughs> they, it's, they received this experience in the beginning, not after. He describes it as being baptized with the Holy Ghost, and he said, they experienced it in the beginning. You begin to see the point. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not the same as the filling of the Holy Spirit. Now, it's obvious that people, <laughs> well it isn't obvious to some people, but it should be obvious to us that as Jesus said he was one with the Father, that he desired us to be one with him. But that is what baptism of the Spirit is. Jesus did not need to be baptized with the Spirit because he was not a sinner. Now, baptism is not salvation in the moment we're going to what baptism is and what it is. But at this point, let me stress that. Jesus is one with the Father, and for us to be one with the Father, we have to be baptized into the body of Christ. It is a once for all process. It happens once. So we can be baptized with or by and filled at the same time. In some of the accounts that we read in Acts, we see people baptized by the Holy Spirit and subsequently or simultaneously filled with the Holy Spirit. Now a lot of people are going to come along and they're going to take various accounts from that, from the book of Acts, and play monkey tricks. They'll come along and say, well okay, they were really saved, but what they need is to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, and which they actually mean by that to be filled with the Holy Spirit. But as I've said, baptism with has been filled with not different. Acts 19 is a classic example. Here we see that Paul passed through the upper coast, came and comes to Ephesus, and notice the scripture says, finding certain disciples. Do you know why he uses the word certain? Because it was a certain kind of disciple. But it wasn't the disciples of the Lord Jesus. And he asked them a question. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? 
And they said, we've not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. So the, the next logical question is, then what on earth? What did you hear? What did you believe? What were you baptized unto? And they told him, we were baptized unto John's baptism. Now please notice that John's baptism is a baptism unto repentance. That is, they should believe on the one which was to come, which is Jesus. So in other words, they had never heard the gospel. They had only heard the preaching of John the Baptist. Then said Paul, John very baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and his faith was on them and prophesied. In other words, they were saved. And as they were saved, they were filled. And because they were filled, they spoke in tongues and prophesied. In other words, they happened simultaneously. Now what basically takes place in the book of Acts is this. God had decreed, by his, in his sovereignty, that he was going to save people in three, or the various people groups of the world, if you like, or representatives of the various people groups of the world in three stages. First, he would save Jews. And he did so on the day of Pentecost. Secondly, he would save half Jews, that is, Samaritans. Or ethnically speaking, they were half Jews. And he did so in the book of Acts, chapter 8. <coughs> and thirdly, he would save Gentiles, that's non Jews. And he does so in Acts 10. Please recognize that there is a time delay in between each of these uh, groups of people being saved. It's important for us to realise that even if Gentiles, and this is, sounds a bit symmetrical, but it, it's important to realise that Gentiles could not be saved before Cornelius, even if they wanted to. Why? Because the actual process of salvation is us being regenerated by the Holy Spirit. It's not just dependent on our belief. There's, a, there's two sides to it, isn't it? This is where sometimes the Armenians and the Calvinists tend to both get confused and fall off either end of the law. <coughs> They somehow get confused as to what sovereignty is and what free will it is, and you end up with both of these teachings that take people nowhere. No, there's a mixture of sovereignty and there's a mixture of free will. In God's sovereignty, He gives us free will to choose. But we cannot just make decisions for Christ and be born again. That's called decisionism. The idea that you just confess Christ and you're regenerated. No, it takes the work of the Holy Spirit working with that faith and repentance to recreate us. So even if, and this is just hypothetical, you might say, even if Gentiles had believed the message of Christ, had they heard it before, they could not be saved until the Holy Spirit or God had decided in His sovereignty, this is the time from now on when Gentiles will be grafted into the Bible. Because God had chosen that Israel would first hear the gospel. That was his prerogative. That was his plan. It is revealed throughout the Old Testament. But in the Old Testament, it also tells us that God would also grant Gentiles in when the Jews reject him. Remember the teachings of Romans. It's right back to the book of Romans, isn't it? Those branches that were broken off, then God added Gentiles. And since then, praise the Lord, he's been adding Gentiles ever since, and Jews too. But after that, that process is finished. The door, if you like, is now open for whomsoever will to just come by faith and repentance to the Savior. And this is where people get confused. They try to read the book of Acts as though it's an epistle, as though it's doctrine for the church, but all it is is a historical account of what took place. And where they get most confused, of course, is Acts 8 with the Samaritans. Here they believe that these Samaritans were saved, but they just needed to receive the Holy Spirit. And I can see where they read that as well. It's quite easy to do so, if you don't read it in light of what the epistles teach. But the fact is, you see, that Philip had baptised these people in water when he should not have done. And the apostles would then come down. You see, the Bible, is unlike any other religious book, it tells us the mistakes as well. And to rectify this mistake, we have the account of the Ethiopian eunuch afterwards, who was a Jew, to put that thing straight. 
whereby he says, well, what do you think of being baptized? And the response of the evangelist is nothing if you believe. But you see, he was a Jew, and the Samaritans were a different, different group of people. Basically what happened was, they believed the message. But because they believed the message, they were not saved. Because the Holy Spirit had to regenerate them from them to be born again. You see the point? And so because they believed the message, if anything is enthusiasm, they had the water baptized. When the, Holy, when the apostles come, and they pray for them, they count them, they receive the Holy Ghost. Now, it's fair to say that a lot of people, and this would include Pentecostals and Charismatics, will look at this particular verse of Scripture and build very much on this to support the idea that there's a second blessing, that you first get saved and you have this subsequent wonderful experience, which as I've already stated should be a continued experience anyway. And this is why great confusion comes. But if you begin to look at this verse of Scripture and the book of Acts, in light of the epistles, which we're now going to do, those, that cloudiness will go away. Okay? And the first one to begin with is Ephesians 4, 5, where we have these great, simple spiritual truths. In fact, Ephesians 4, 4 and 5. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called into, or even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. So are there many baptisms of the Spirit? Ephesians 4 5 says no. Ephesians 4 5 says there is one baptism. And then some people come along and say, oh yes, you see, but that's talking about water baptism, brother, you've got confused. Well, let's look at the context of the verse. Is it talking about ritual or spiritual? Is it talking about ceremonial or spiritual reality? One body. It's spiritual, isn't it? The body of Christ is a spiritual reality. One hope of that calling is a spiritual reality. One Lord is a spiritual reality. One faith is a spiritual reality. One baptism, ceremonial. It's not talking about the ceremony, it's talking about the spiritual. There is one baptism. And as I've said, that baptism is what takes place when we are saved, and again in a moment we'll see exactly what that is. So there's one baptism, but there are many fillings. Okay? Now, let's now look at some of the uh, truths that support that. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. That is what baptism of the spirit is. We are baptized into the body of Christ. That is what it is. Baptism of the Holy Spirit is when we are placed into the body of Christ. And that ties together with all the pronouncements of Jesus through the Gospels. His intercessory prayer in John 17, that we would all be one. Are you telling me that the prayers of Jesus are not answered? There's no way. The prayers of Jesus Christ were all answered. And he prayed that we would all be one. As well, are we? Well, it depends on what perspective you're looking at. Doctrinally, are we all one? No. Spiritual growth, are we all one? No. Intelligence, no. Prosperity, no. Are we all in the body of Christ? Yes. Amen. How are we all in the body of Christ? So if you hear in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, for by one spirit <coughs> are we all baptized into one body. That means that if you're a Baptist, and you're saved, you're in the body of Christ. If you're a Pentecostal and you're saved, you are in the body of Christ. If you're a free Presbyterian and you're saved, you are in the body of Christ. 
And if you are in one body, you are in one spirit. And the prayer of Jesus in John 17 is realized. Because baptism with the spirit is placing us into the body of Christ. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is God's divine operation of his spirit which places us in Christ. This makes all believers one. And through that we share a common salvation, we share a common hope and a common destiny. Praise God, isn't that wonderful? Remember what I said to you this morning? Some people teach that there is a full gospel. We have the full gospel, brethren. Those guys only have that half gospel because they don't understand these other things. Now the scripture doesn't say there's a full and half gospel, as we said this morning. There is only the common salvation. The hope that is common to all of us. And that is what makes us one. That we are in one body. Even on the subject of gifts, Corinthians teaches exactly the same thing. We are one body being many members. And it also does something else. It affects our state and standing before God. It affects our position and our experience. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit by placing us into the body of Christ makes us available for many things. It makes us, if you like, the baptism of the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ does not fill us. It is, it is not experiential, but it puts us in a place where we can experience the fullness of God, where we can be filled with the Holy Spirit, where we can have an experiential walk with God. But it's simply like this. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not experiential. The filling of the Holy Spirit sometimes is. How many of you pray and in your times of prayer you're overwhelmed with the presence of God and you just cry? How many of you who have lost a loved one, when you see God, you just have an overwhelming sense of peace? That is experiential. That is the result of being filled with God's because it brings peace. You can say it like this again, that the baptism of the Holy Spirit which places us into the body of Christ unites us with the one who gives life, whereas salvation itself puts life in us. Regeneration puts life in us, but being in the body of Christ unites us with the life-giving one. So what can we say? First of all, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not the new birth. Okay? So let's look at some of the things that it is not. The new birth, or regeneration, is when we are given life itself. So it is not the new birth. Romans 6, 3, 4. We are baptized to Christ on his death, so that as he was raised up, we should have or walk in newness of life. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit, by placing us into his body, puts us positionally in a place where we can walk with newness of life. We can receive that life. Galatians 3.27 For as many of you as have been, or as have put on Christ, have been baptized into Christ. <coughs> Colossians 2.12 We are buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who have raised him from the dead. That baptism places us into his body, a body in which has been crucified a body which has been resurrected, a body which has been glorified. This is why he uses this symbolism, because that is to be our experience. We are to die to self, aren't we? We are to be resurrected to new life, aren't we? And to walk in that newness of life, so people can see that we really have the Spirit of God. And we are still yet to be glorified, aren't we? Which will be achieved by that same Holy Spirit that will all of us. Isn't that marvellous? So clearly, being baptized into Christ places us in a position to experience that positional fullness. In other words, we cannot be in Christ if He's not first in us. You can put it this way: those who do not have the Spirit of Christ are none of His. So you are either Christ or you are not. It's as simple as that. John seventeen twenty three. 
I am in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. Colossians 1.27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. <laughs> Revelation 2.20, second part of the verse, I will come in the supper of him, and he with me. All those things are realised because we are placed into the body of Christ. That is what baptism is. So baptism of the Spirit is not the new birth, although it happens simultaneously. The moment we are regenerated, we are placed in Christ. Secondly, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not the indwelling, but the indwelling happens simultaneously to our regeneration. Every believer has a spirit, and as such, according to 2 Corinthians 1 20, all the promises of God are yea and in him. Amen. In other words, every promise of the Holy Spirit is available to every believer. Romans 8 9, that you are not in the flesh but in the spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God will in you. Now, if any man hath not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Galatians 3 2 and 3. Let's turn to that. Galatians 3, verses 2 and 3. Now, here Paul asks the Galatians this question, doesn't he? This only would I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? That's a vital question there. Do you receive the Holy Spirit by works? No, by faith. Faith or formula? We'll look at that in a bit. It is by faith. In Galatians 4, 6. And because you are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So we conclude by saying, it is impossible to be regenerated and not in the world. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not the new world. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not the new birth. But they both happen simultaneously with the whole package of regeneration. And thirdly, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not the sealing of the Spirit, which also happens simultaneously. As with the previous distinct works of God's Spirit, it happens at the same time as regeneration. This sealing is until our full redemption and glorification. God has sealed us and stamped us out of his own property until the day that he glorifies us. And was there nothing we have to do to uh, cause that to happen? It all happened at the same time we received Christ. Galatians 1.13 After I believed, I was sealed. Amen. Galatians 4.30 Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Now, if the Holy Spirit is not in you, you could not grieve him, could you? So again, at the same time we are sealed, we are baptized into the body, we are indwelt, and there are some 30 odd truths that you can look for in your Bibles which take place the moment that we put faith in Christ. Number four, being baptized with the Holy Spirit is not the second blessing. It is the first blessing of your life because it is what takes place when you are saved. Regeneration, if you want to take notes on this, regeneration gives us Christ's own life. And these are all distinct works of the Holy Spirit which take place simultaneously. The reason I'm breaking down is so that you can see the differences, even though they're not separated, they are distinct. You can see those differences because these are all wonderful truths that we need to grasp if we're going to understand what being filled with the Spirit really is and how to be filled with the Spirit. Regeneration gives us Christ's own life. Number two, baptism with the Spirit unites us to Christ himself. Number three, indwelling gives us his continual presence. Number four, sealing stamps us as his own for eternity. Number five, by his anointing, he has set us apart for our holy life and service. And that is the crunch, isn't it? 
How do we live or realize this holy life of service? Well, the answer is, we must be continually filled. And that's when we do the opposite. So the last point on that we can say is that baptism of the Holy Spirit is not the filling of the Spirit. And that should have been evident already from what I've already said. Why? Because Jesus was never baptized with the Spirit. Only sinners are baptized with the Holy Spirit. But Jesus was filled. And it's quite simple. You go home, you take the strongest importance, you take your good Bible dictionary, and you look up every reference to being baptized with the Spirit and you see exactly what I'm saying in here. You see, you can come up with a theology of second blessing if you only take a few scriptures. You can come up with almost any theology if you just take a few scriptures. But you can't until you take all of them together. You can suppose that according to the book of Acts there was the first blessing and then the second blessing, but not when read in light of the epistles and what they clearly teach. The baptism of the Spirit is not filling the Spirit. Baptizing is once, filling is continuous. Baptizing us into the body of Christ is not experiential. Filling with the Spirit is often experiential. Baptizing us into the body of Christ puts us in a position where we can receive experiential force, which is the repeatable filling of the Spirit. Now what will the filling of the Spirit produce? Well, first it will, it will produce character through fruits, won't it? And that's what we looked at this morning, the fruits of the Spirit versus the gifts. Charles Parham effectively, effectively began something that's, that is rather close to some today. He essentially replaced the biblical doctrine that fruit of the Spirit was evidence of regeneration for gifts. In his case, known tongues. He didn't believe in unknown tongues, incidentally, he only believed in known languages, which were later shown to be nonsense. But the first thing we see is that we develop character through the fruit of the Holy Spirit, Galatians 5.22. So that will be in effect of being filled. Secondly, we will have power for testimony, Acts 1 and 8. Boldness for witnessing, Acts 4, 31. Being filled with the Spirit results in the Holy Spirit's teaching. John 16, 13, if you believe in his water. Five, being filled with the Spirit will produce True praise and worship. Ephesians 5, 18 to 20. Sing to yourself in songs and hymns, psalm, spiritual song. Number six, being filled with the Spirit will produce divine guidance. Romans 8, 14. You are the sons of God, you will be led by the Holy Spirit. Those are all things that we need. We need to be filled with the Spirit to overcome the problems in the churches today. We need people who have character. Not the so-called characters we're seeing on the, on the stages today that have shown them all the nonsense that's going on. That will only come out of the Spirit. In other words, it is not a gift, but fruit. So how do we do it? Well, as I've said, it's by faith in our formula. And just to reiterate the scripture I used from Galatians 3, verses 13 to 14. Galatians 3, 13 and 14. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through the faith. So here's the first clue. To be filled with the Spirit is by faith, not formula. You can tarry for your Pentecost, you can line up at the altar and cry, Jesus, 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 till Jesus comes back. You can go to Pensacola, Toronto, or God knows where else, and do any number of wonderful things to be filled with the Spirit. But it won't be. It's by faith. It's that simple, it's by faith. How are people saved? Are they saved by falling on their knees up the mountain? No. Counting beads and doing penance? No. Saved? Are they saved by going to church and doing good works? No. How are they saved? By faith. Everything in the Christian world is by faith. It's so simple, isn't it? So simple that we can miss it. Now what happened when a 
person gets saved? When a person gets saved, they believe in the message. And when they believe the message of who Jesus is, what sin is, um, how sin is affected them, and when they believe the story of the resurrection, those are the three essential parts of any gospel message, they then put faith in Christ for salvation. Faith is putting trust in someone or something who has a power or ability that you yourself do not possess. And that tells you a little bit about being filled with the Spirit too, because we know that even though we're saved, we have a sinful flesh, don't we? Then what do you have of sinful flesh? No. Why? Because we are, if you like, a <coughs> spirit, soul, and body. Everything that God has created is a reflection of Himself, if you like, three parts. We are made in the image of God, imaginary deity, spirit, soul, and body. Everything in the universe is a reflection of God. Think about it for a moment. What about time? Uh, it's past, present, future, isn't it? Two are invisible, one is visible. The present is visible. What about us? Spirit, soul, body. Two parts are invisible, one part is visible. How many of you have seen the soul recently? Nobody. Anybody seen the spirit? No. It's spiritual. What about the universe? Space, time, and matter. Two are invisible, one is visible. So everything is a reflection of God. And when a person is saved, the first thing that happens is their spirit is changed once and for all. It's a finished work. Accomplished by the finished work of Jesus on the cross. So our spirit is changed. But then there's two other parts of which there is our soul, which is not changed, is it? Not a great deal of the say. That's why Paul says that we need to renew our mind daily through the word of God. And then of course there is our spirit. Uh, I'm sorry, our body, which will not be changed until we go to the people of the Lord, until He raises, glorifies us. So you could say this, so our salvation has been finished, it's still going on, and it's yet to be completed. And this again is where the Armenians get confused. Because there is an aspect to our salvation which is still yet to be realized, but there is absolutely an aspect of our salvation, the most fundamental part of our salvation, that is finished forever. That our spirit is stamped and sealed and regenerated and baptized into the body of Christ and has the indwelling of his spirit and there's nothing we need to do to change that. In other words, our position, our eternal position before God is secure. And you can only believe that when you understand correctly what the difference is between being baptized with and being filled with. If you miss it on those things, you never have assurance of salvation. But the other things affect our walk. The baptizing with the, with the Spirit of God, placing us into, that, into His body, is a once more process which means we're eternally secure. But the filling of the Holy Spirit affects our walk before God, our state before God. And you might say it this way, those of us who are not filled with the Holy Spirit are in a right state before God. Because we need to be filled with His Spirit. John 15, 7 says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you will and it will be done for you. So the first thing we need to realize how to be filled with the Spirit, it is, it is by faith. Secondly, if you're going to be filled with the Spirit, you must abide in His Word. Mel Unger, the author of the Unger Bible Dictionary, said this, Man is always keenly tempted to substitute ritual for reality in being spiritual. Always wants to substitute ritual for reality. In other words, the reality of being filled with the Holy Spirit is a promise to all, and we only have to lay on in it by faith. We don't have to work anything up. We don't have to see the 16 chorus, we don't have to pray in tongues for two hours. No, we just understand by faith that God has done everything that needs to be done and provides everything that we need to receive. And to have that faith, we must know what the Word of God says on that subject. 
Why? Because a person can only be saved by the preaching of the gospel. Everybody agrees with that, yes? There's lots of churches where they believe that if we just do this, that, and the other, have a good music group and call the Holy Spirit down, it's all hocus pocus, of course. People can be saved without the preaching of the gospel. That's straight from Romanism. We hold up the way through and say, hocus pocus, dear, that's where we get the word hocus pocus from. And the way that something becomes Jesus incarnate. Well, the charismatic version of that is we just play enough music, the Holy Spirit, who is God, will come down by the words of the priest. Just the charismatic version of Roman heresy. No, preaching is the means by which people are saved. They hear the gospel and they put faith in the God who, in the God who has, the God of that message. And that is the same way we are to be filled with the Spirit. Finally, we can look at Ephesians 5, 18 and 19. You will notice first again, it's quite a little bit. And be not drunk with wine or with his excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Speak it to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, and make the melody in your heart to the Lord. And again, Scripture is a part of that. It's a part of that recommendation. When people begin to sing and worship God, they will experience the filling of the Spirit. <coughs> But please notice, it's not the sort of wishy-washy doctrinalist nonsense we've got today. I mean, that song we had earlier on that one, we want to think about the words of the sister and singing. Why was Jesus now to the cross? There's a message in there, isn't there? It's not this shine Jesus, shine always. Absolute garbage we've got today. You cannot experience the feeling of God's spirit without understanding the truths on which it is based. And that's what we need to do. <coughs> we need to get back, not to a second blessing, but a continual blessing. People who are advocating the second blessing, also, most of the time don't even understand the first one anyway, and not much walking out of it yet. But if we are filled with the Spirit, we will make a difference by His strength, because the flesh is weak, isn't it? The flesh is weak, that's why we need that filling. But we can go and do the work of the gospel. And the problem is that so many today have come up with the right idea but the wrong reality. They've got the right idea. Yes, we need to be filled with the Yes, we need to be filled with the But then they replace faith with the formula. They replace reality with ritual. And it has many forms, whether it's unknown tongues or whether it's Go to Pensacola or whether it's flagellating yourself in the convent. It's all one and the same thing at the end of the day. There is no problem. It's just that God is free to those who ask. Amen. Amen.